Um, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to this um, HVRA hosted webinar on um, Regulation uh, 2019-6. Um, uh, my name is um, David Murphy. I will be acting in the role of uh, the moderator um, for this event. Um, and I would like uh, to well welcome you all, as I say, um, uh, representatives from um, an industry. Um, I am also conscious that there will be uh, members of our advisory committee on veterinary medicines um, who are also in attendance at this event um, and also um, uh, colleagues here from the HVRA um, both within the veterinary sciences department um, and uh, outside of that. So I would like to welcome you all as I say. Um, if we could go on to the next slide please. And the objectives of this um, uh, session today um, is to raise awareness of upcoming changes that will impact on the regulation of veterinary medicinal products. Um, in a series of presentations that will be delivered by my colleagues, um, we will be provided with a high level overview um, focusing on aspects of the regulation which will directly affect how marketing authorization holders engage with the regulatory system. Um, we will also look to outline the next steps in the implementation pathway um, and provide information uh, where, uh, on where stakeholders uh, may find relevant information. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the outline of the webinar is as uh, uh, presented in the published program. Uh, we will begin with um, an introduction. Uh, so that will be um, Dr. Beechner, who will sort of set the scene and then move through, as I say, a series of presentations um, that will last between um, seven to ten minutes long. Um, we will move directly from one presentation um, to another. Um, and then at the end of uh, the uh, uh, suite of presentations, we will have uh, a period of time, 30 minutes, hopefully, for questions and answers. Um, and then we will conclude the session um, after 90 minutes. Um, next slide, please. Um, in relation to um, opportunities to ask questions, um, uh, we would um, suggest that you use the Q&A function um, in this platform to submit your questions. Um, you are muted by the presenter, so there will not be an opportunity for um, uh, to ask questions verbally. Um, when asking questions, uh, I would please ask that you indicate who the question is addressed to. Um, I would also ask you to note that there will be a time lapse between submitting your question and it appearing in the feed. Um, so just do be conscious of that. Uh, you don't need to resubmit uh, the same question. Um, in terms of addressing the questions, we will attempt to um, address uh, though, or any questions asked during the Q&A session. So they will be addressed verbally. Um, there will be no written responses um, during the webinar. But subsequent to this, um, uh, event, um, we will provide or publish all questions asked uh, together with written responses and those will be presented on the HPRA website. So that's uh, just by way of welcome. Um, I'm going to now move directly um, to the first uh, presentation and that, as I say, will be given by um, Dr. Gabriel Beechner. Um, you will all be very familiar with Dr. Beechner. Um, he's uh, the director of the uh, Veterinary Sciences Department here at the HPRA. Um, so, Dr. Beechner, I will hand over to you. Thank you very much, uh, David. I'm just putting up my screen now. Um, hopefully, you can see that. Yeah, we can see your screen. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm looking. I, I seem to have difficulties myself in seeing the the screen. Um, let me just see if I can move the presentation on. Yeah. So, um, sorry about the delay. Just wanting to say as well that some of our colleagues from the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine are also on the line, and I'd want to on behalf of the HPRA to extend a, a warm welcome to them as well. Um, just before we get into the detail of the new veterinary regulation, you need to understand maybe that the HPRA here is responsible for issues around the manufacture, authorization, 
of veterinary medicines and also pharmacovigilance monitoring. And you'll be aware that the Department of Agriculture or DAFM is responsible for issues such as the wholesalers, the licensing of wholesalers in Ireland, uh, the um, national legislation. So they're busy compiling the new uh, veterinary legislation, the new SI, as well as issues relating to the retail sale of, of medicines, the use, cascade provision and, and compliance on the ground. The, so returning then to the regulation and you'll be familiar with the objectives of the regulation. I'm not going to read them all here, but just, you know, basically this is a significant change from the existing rule book, which is designed ultimately to give fit for purpose legislation to address, address the next uh, period uh, um, and probably will last uh, for 20 or more years. Um, also to understand that the, there are various uh, moving parts, so to speak, in this whole framework. So even though the regulation itself has been adopted, uh, there is a now a period of secondary legislation um, where details of the uh, framework legislation are being elaborated. Um, and that's been elaborated in concert, if you like, and following advice from the European Medicines Agency. And in, in some cases, it's a it's a co-decision with member states and uh, ultimately the European Commission is driving the elaboration of the secondary legislation. Um, within the European Medicines Agency, a significant element is the elaboration of new IT systems. And in essence, there are four systems and we'll hear a lot more about them during the course of, of this webinar. The Union Product Database, which underpins everything and which will basically be an information on all medicines, not only centrally authorized medicines, but also medicines in every member state that has been authorized. So this is a, a very significant uh, database of probably over 30,000 products. We will have a union product database. I'm not going to dwell on it because my colleague Paul McNeil will, will deal with that later on. A union database of manufacturing and wholesale distribution, which are my colleague Paul Sexton will deal with. And then there'll be a database on collection of data on sales and use of antimicrobials in animals. This is a novel component, never before developed, and this has been done uh, under the ages of the Department of Agriculture. So we probably won't be coming back to that here. Um, and then the agency has other issues as well, but um, significant to say that the a focus of the EMA is to develop these central systems which member states have to adapt their own systems to communicate, interface and populate. So it's a, there's a huge amount of work for member states to do. This is an icon that you'll be seeing as well throughout the course of the morning because other people refer to it. But just to say, you know, these are the in interconnections and um, you can see, as I say, the union product database is more or less central to the operation of the other databases. Um, in some, to some extent, uh, what we're faced here is a little bit what's it's called agile development, agile IT programs. And those of you who are involved in IT will know that this is a kind of a well-known concept. So you, you effectively, unlike when you go into, for example, purchase a new television and you get a finished product, when you move into the IT space, you're if you like deciding and iterating what you're purchasing by virtue of, of um, interaction and interface with the system. And so this means that, for example, the specification of the union product database called the UPD, that is actually not nailed down just at this point in time. So we, we have an idea of what it contains, um, but it's not finalized. And that's, that poses a difficulty for HPRA and other member states in terms of developing up our own systems to interact with effectively what is a moving target. And I'm sure you face the same issues yourselves as MAHs when you look forward to say, well, what exactly are we facing? Because, for example, the national legislation here has not yet been nailed down um, and will not be nailed down until towards the end of the year. So this is the time frame. The um, regulation itself was uh, adopted in 2019. It becomes applicable in January 2022. So, you know, we're fairly far along and there are 20 pieces of secondary legislation to be developed during this implementation period, two of which have been elaborated already. 
So the, just from the European Commission, they have stated that the overall the work is progressing on time uh, and that uh, this 2021 uh, is the busiest year in terms of the, the effort that's needed. However, just to understand as well that within the, within the HPRA, we have our own uh, cycle mapped out, if you like. So there are various components here. I'm not going to read them out to you, but you can see there's a communications plan. There's various work streams. There's uh, IT substance mapping to the European database, and there's a work stream around transitional uh, plan developments as we migrate from the current systems and business processes to the 2B processes in January 2022. And then just to say that actually 2022 is one milestone, but there are others. So while if you like most of the heavy lifting will be done um, by January 2022, there are 11 legal acts which will follow and some of these have significant effects in their own right. Again, I'm, I'm not going to discuss them all this morning. It's too, bit, too much in that slide, but just to say, as I say, that this isn't a, just a, a one time issue. There, there are uh, issues for the future to, to understand. And with that, Chairman, I'll hand back control to you and thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that uh, presentation, uh, Gabriel, um, um, setting the, the scene as it were. Um, we will now move um, directly um, to the next presentation, um, and this is uh, relates to the Union Product Database. Um, and uh, here to present on this topic um, is Elaine Hines. Um, Elaine is um, head of the uh, ad administration team uh, within the Veterinary Sciences Department. She's a planning and licensing manager, um, and she's also um, very involved in the um, development of the UPD um, at a European level. So, um, Elaine, in your own time, please. Thank you, Chair, for that invite. Um, can I just check that you can see my screen? Um, yes, we can see your screen. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, so as David said, I am the Planning and Authorization Manager in the Veterinary Sciences Department, um, and I'm also leading the work stream um, that we have set up internally for the UPD project. Um, we initiated last year uh, in order for us to be UPD ready in 2022. And today I'll give you a brief update on the progress we are making so far and any information we have from a European level. So my presentation will cover at a high level the scope and objectives of UPD, how to access UPD, its main functionalities and the MAH data responsibilities, a brief overview of SPORE and important information for MAHs to note and um, give you some update on some proposed training at an EMA level. I also just want to mention that there are many outstanding questions which we may not have the answer to today relating to UPD um, and we are awaiting further information from the EMA and from CMDV um, within their guidance documents. So please ensure that you bring yourself up to speed on the items mentioned in my presentation today and keep abreast of further developments at an EU level. There are links in my presentation as I move through it and um, as I, I, I think the presentations are going to be made available after this um, webinar, so you should be able to access them. Um, so Article 55 in Regulation 2019-6 provides the legal basis for the Union Product Database. The regulation mandates competent authorities to electronically submit and maintain information on veterinary medicinal products in the UPD. The Commission Implementing Act uh, which there is a link there to, lays down the necessary measures and the practical arrangements for the UPD and details the specifications to implement in order to fully um, fulfil the requirements of the regulation. So the following products are in scope of UPD authorised uh, veterinary medicinal products as referred to in Article 5.1, homeopathics as referred to in Article 85.1 of the regulation, veterinary medicinal products intended for animals, which are exclusively kept as pets, as per Article 5.6, and parallel traded veterinary medicinal products as specified in Article 102. So quickly to just look at some of the objectives of UPD, there are a number of them, but mainly it is there to improve transparency and access to information on veterinary medicinal products. 
Um, it will help improve data quality in the regulatory processes by using controlled vocabularies and it's allowing self-service access for MAHs for certain regulatory activities, um, namely variations that do not require assessment. So access in the UPD, the UPD access policy is now available and defines the access rights for different stakeholder groups. The document should enable actors to perform their obligations as provided for in the regulation while protecting commercially confidential information and personal data. Uh, there are three different levels of access in the UPD and they are access for the European Commission, competent authorities and agencies, so that's one level. The access for marketing authorization holders, so MAHs will be able to access all information about their veterinary medicinal products following secure authentication and authorization. And then there's access for the general public as well. Um, there is also information for MAHs in the EU VET implementation guide, specifically chapter one, covering registration and data access requirements. And there is a link within um, this presentation to that document. So it is worth um, having a look at. And it's also worth noting that this guide is still in draft and is not due to be finalized until May or due time this year. So to quickly look at the main functionalities UPD will provide, um, the NCAs, which are represented on the left of this graphic, will be able to submit product information and documents, will be able to search, view and export data, um, will be able to view, approve and uh, reject variations requiring assessment, and also manage notifications and have access to data analytics. The MAH portal shown in the centre of the graphic will allow the submission of other post authorization data or OPAD as it's been termed and can be seen there. This is a certain cohort of data that the MAH is responsible for maintaining and I will discuss that in the uh, next slide. You will also be able to search, view and export data from UPD, um, compile and submit variations not requiring assessment and also manage notifications. Uh, the general public uh, also have a portal and they'll be able to access published product data and have the capability um, to search, view and export information. So to look at some of the MAH's main responsibilities in UPD, um, so laid down in the regulation, you have responsibility for data that, as I said, is so-called other post authorization data. These requirements are also outlined in the implementation guide that I mentioned earlier. Um, this guide is available to support competent authorities and marketing authorization holders in submitting veterinary medicinal product data into UPD in compliance with agreed formats and terminologies. So based on the regulation and the implementation guide, the following information is required from January 2022 onwards. So dates when your authorized products are placed on the market, uh, you will capture changes in the availability of each of your VMPs at the appropriate level. Uh, MAHs will update your product's marketing authorization status in the case of suspension or revocation and the associated dates of these status changes. And please note um, that according to the VET implementation guide for existing veterinary medicinal products that were placed on the market before the 28th of January 2022, Dates for placing on the market and availability uh, should be recorded in UPD by the 28th of January 2023. MAHs will also be responsible for the recording of the annual volume of sales for each of their products at the appropriate level. And indeed, as already stated, variations not requiring assessment will be uh, recorded in, in UPD by MAHs. Also in accordance with Article 18.8 in the Implementing Act, it is also MAH's responsibility to ensure the data and documents recorded in UPD for your products are correct and up to date. So although this information is not required for your products until after January 28, 2022, uh, you should start reviewing your data and taking necessary steps to prepare the data for this update to UPD. Um, just to note, the EMA has established a dedicated email address for all stakeholders to communicate with them on the new veterinary regulation, particularly the IT components. So if you need further, in further information on the submission and update of data, 
in UPD or you have any questions in general on UPD, um, please contact them directly at the vet change email address that can be seen on your screen. Just quickly, and I'm, I'm not going to go into it too much from an NCA perspective, but the mandatory, leg the mandatory legacy data, which is required for uploading to UPD um, from NCAs, is quite extensive and, and requires a huge amount of dedicated work to adapt our database and to enrich our data. And in some instances, we have to supply data that we currently do not do not house in our databases. Um, one example being QPPV data. We are awaiting feedback from the EMA if they are in a position to help with the legacy data requirement, but if not, we may need to validate some of this data with MAHs. And um, in, in, in the event that we do, we will, we will pro provide communication with you shortly. So just to briefly touch on variations not requiring assessment and um, the development of the process for variations not requiring assessment is continuing within the EMA uh, UPD working groups, which are attended by NCAs and industry, as well as at a CMD, uh, CMDV level. However, these discussions have, have not yet been finalised. So, um, but at a high level, we, we do know that MAHs will assemble the data and documents for, for variations not requiring assessment in UPD for submission. Notifications will be accessible to relevant stakeholders when the submissions are made and then NCAs will approve or reject the submissions and have the ability to upload documents and update data fields where needed. Notifications will also then be accessible to, to relevant stakeholders upon that approval or rejection. And Mary may talk about that further in her variations presentation. So to really quickly touch on SPORE, uh, SPORE services manage the lists of controlled terminologies which will be supplied in the electronic submission of uh, veterinary product information into UPD. SPORE is made up of referentials, organisations and substance data um, and SPORE is a set of separate systems that require registration as outlined in Chapter 1 of the Implementation Guide and as we discussed earlier. Um, and SPOR, uh, the UPD is actually built on the existing PMS database structure um, with connection to the three other services of SPOR. And I just wanted to mention here that in order for NCAs and MAHs to complete a veterinary medicinal product record in UPD with organisation information, all, organi all organisations included in the set of UPD data related to the application or, or um, the application for your veterinary medicinal product must be registered in uh, organization management services which is OMS and you can see um, a link on your screen there to a manual describing how to register an organization um, with OMS. Uh, just to cover training really quickly we are aware that EMA are planning training event events during 2021 Although we have not seen a finalised schedule, we understand that training is due to be provided on areas like the registration process, uh, submission of variations not requiring assessment, the user interface itself and searching viewing um, data. That training will be provided to NCAs and to um, industry as, as well. So just to recap, um, I know there's a lot of information in the presentation, so some of the key messages and um, please review the access policy along with chapter one of the implementation guide for information on access and registration in UPD. Uh, please review further chapters of the Fed implementation guide and um, because they provide stakeholders, including uh, MAHs with detailed guidance on the submission of information on medicinal products. Uh, this will help you prepare for the submission of MAH specific data. Also keep in mind that this document is still in draft. And although you probably have lots of questions on variations not requiring assessment that we cannot answer today, uh, there will be more information available during 2021 to, to NCAs and industry. Um, if not already done, please register your organisation data in OMS. And, and just as we've already shown, we are confident that EMA training will be provided um, to MAHs on specific aspects of, UT, on, of UPD. So thank you very much for your uh, attention this morning. If you have any questions, please ask and we can cover them at the end and um, put them in the chat and I'll pass you back to David. Thank you.
Okay, um, thank you very much um, for that, Elaine. Uh, a very clear um, um, overview in terms of the, the, the Union Product Database. Um, again, just um, to remind people while we uh, prepare for the next presentation, um, that uh, if you have questions, please submit them through the Q&A function um, and indicating who the question um, is addressed to. Um, the other thing, just to remind people, as indicated uh, in response to the very first question that was posed, um, yes, these slide presentations will be made available um, at following the meeting. So the intention is that it will be um, made available on the HPRA website. Um, OK, we will move directly to the next uh, presentation, and this relates um, to variations and the changes around that. Um, the uh, presenter for this item um, is Mary O'Grady. Uh, again, Mary is someone who you will all be familiar with. Um, she's uh, the Quality Assessment Manager within the Veterinary um, uh, Sciences Department of the HBRA. Um, she is also a co-opted um, CBMP member um, and is the uh, Vice Chair of the Quality Working Party um, of, uh, of the CBMP. So, um, Mary, in your own time, please. Um, thank you very much, David. I can just can I just check again that everybody can see my presentation and hear me OK? Yeah, we can see the presentation and hear you loud and clear. Great, thank you very much. So thank you for the nice introduction and good morning to everybody. So in the next few minutes, I am going to try and give you a flavour of the main changes in the regulation that are related to variations. So um, the main change really in relation to variations is that our current classification system will no longer apply. So going forward, we will only have two types of variations. They are variations not requiring assessment and variations requiring assessment. And uh, given our love of abbreviations, these have already become known as VNRA and VRA. So what do we know about variations not requiring assessment? Well. I won't go into the, the history or the process of the timelines, which are laid out in this slide, but the regulation specified that a list of variations not requiring assessment to be established, and um, that was done by an implementing act. And this implementing act was, in fact, one of the first to be adopted by the Commission. So the implementing act has been adopted and um, published, and it contains a list of all the variations not requiring assessment. So the format of these variations and this list is uh, kind of familiar, um, but slightly different to what we're used to. And there's also a current, um, uh, the current best practice guide is under revision and there will be a new CMDB best practice guide to cover these variations. So this slide, I just wanted to show you what the format looks like of this list of variations not requiring assessment. So you'll see that it is quite familiar. It's divided up into sections. So it's section A is an administrative changes. There's section B is quality changes, C safety and efficacy changes, and section D relates to vaccine master file changes. So again, you can see it looks quite familiar, similar to our existing guideline in that the changes are grouped under these headings. There are lists of uh, conditions that are required to be fulfilled, and in some cases there are documentation requirements that need to be um, fulfilled or provided. So another thing to point out in relation to the format is that um, where there are conditions and documents listed under a main change, such as here under change 10, these same conditions and documentation requirements also apply to any of the changes that are listed on, as subheadings within the same category. So in this example here, where we have the addition of an in-process limit under 10b, the conditions to be applied are those that are listed under point 10, as well as those under 10B, and then the documentation requirements are those that are listed under 10 as well. So in relation to the process around variations not requiring assessment, this is actually quite well laid out in, um, in the regulation. So um, the MAH will go directly into the UPD record and update the change um, against the product. So um, this has to be done within 30 days of implementation and it must include the required documentation. So the required documents will be those that are listed in the variation, the list of variations not requiring assessment, and then also where affected the label, the leaflet, and the um, public assessment report. Um, there won't be a separate test submission required for these um, variations not requiring assessment. The um, 
there won't be an application form of the applicant. The MAH will simply go directly into the database and make the changes or make the submission within the database. Um, the competent authority will then either approve or reject the change and the MAH and the CMS will be notified by the database directly by a notification um, when the change has been approved or rejected. Um, the decision itself will be published via the database and also any labels, SPC changes, etc., will be published via the database. So as Elaine mentioned in the previous presentation, there are a lot of the details around this process that we're not yet clear on. So um, some of those we have to await until the further developments within the UPD and to know the exact functionalities um, on how they will be managed. So that's just a, a broad outline of the process. So what about variations requiring assessment? What do we know about those? All right. So in terms of what they are, so essentially every variation that is not listed in the list of variations not requiring assessment will automatically become a variation requiring assessment. So the current classification guideline that we're all used to will no longer apply. Um, CMDV and EMA have been working very hard and I have to say very productively on developing a new variation guideline. Um, and again, the format and the categorization of this guideline will be kind of familiar to you, but again, slightly different. Um, it will include Z categories that we're familiar with from our existing guideline, um, and that will be to cater for variations that are not listed or variations not requiring assessment that may not meet the requirements to fulfill, um, to be submitted via the UPD. It will also include an Article 5 type procedure for unlisted variations, um, and as for the variations not requiring assessment, the CMDB are also working on a best practice guide. So, um, wrong way. So, in terms of the classification guide for variations requiring assessment, unfortunately, this guide is not yet finalist, finalized and it hasn't been published yet, so I can't show you what it's going to look like. But I can tell you that it includes classification codes that start with the letter E. And that is simply to avoid any potential confusion with the variations requiring assessment, not requiring assessment. Um, there are documentation requirements listed for some variations, not for all. So kind of analogous to the situation where we have currently do documentation requirements for type 1B variations, but not for type 2. So a similar approach has been adopted here. Um, there's a similar structure to what we're used to. So there's a section on admin, there's a section on quality, safety and efficacy, et cetera. And then the various variations are listed under the headings with subcategories as required. So the regulation um, requires that the variations requiring assessment are dealt with within a 60 day timetable. So that will be the standard timetable for these variations. Um, there will, however, also be a a shorter timetable for less complex variations and a longer timetable for more complex variations. Um, just a couple of other points to note around um, the variation requirements in the regulation. So we have uh, work sharing is catered for in Article 65, um, where the same change is applied for, and actually it will now be compulsory when the same change is being applied in different member states. The regulation states that an implementing act will be developed to cover work sharing, but currently this implementing act is not high on the list of priorities. As Gabriel mentioned, there's an awful lot of legislation still to be developed. So this one may not be available um, before the implementation of the regulation, but until such time as it is, the CMDB guidance document that I refer to will apply to the work sharing procedure. Um, grouping is also catered for in Article 64. Um, and in Article 66, which describes the procedures for variations requiring assessment, there is also a new procedure for re-examination of an opinion, and this can be done at the request of an MAH. It is important to note that variations not requiring assessment cannot be included in work sharing or grouping. They can only be dealt with directly in the UPD. Um, in UPD, it is currently envisaged that it will be possible to link a single variation to multiple marketing authorizations. So and essentially, they will be able to done, be done in a, in a lean way within UPD, but they won't be able to be included within work sharing or grouping applications that include variations requiring assessment. So very quickly to look at the next steps. So um, 
sorry, a CMDB guidance, as I said, on the variations requiring assessment under development. That is near final. It, needs, it will be adopted by HMA and CVMP, and it is expected to be published in June. Then CMDB is also working on other best practice guides, in, including ones relating to variations requiring assessment, which is almost complete. Um, the best practice guide for variations not requiring assessment is in progress, but it has to await the um, further details around the UPD functionalities and how that will interact. Um, there is also another guide on the classification of unlisted variations, and that one is also nearly complete. And then there will be further guides developed around grouping, work sharing, and the re-examination procedure. And that is all from me, so I shall hand you back to David, and thank you very much for your attention. Keith, um, again, thank you very much, Mary, for a very clear, um, concise overview of the main changes in respect of variations. Um, so again, if you've got any questions for Mary, please um, put them into the Q&A function, and we will look to address as many as we can during the Q&A session um, once all presentations are completed. Um, so we will move now directly on to the next presentation that we have, and this relates to um, pharmacovigilance activities. Um, so here to give this presentation um, is uh, Paul McNeil. Uh, Paul is, uh, again, someone you'll all be familiar with, the veterinary assessment manager within the veterinary sciences department. Um, he um, is the alternate CBMP member, um, and he is also a member of the efficacy working party. Um, so, Paul, um, in your own time, please. Thank you very much, David. Um, again, just to check, can everybody hear and see the screen? Yeah, we can okay. hear you well and we can see the screen. Thank you. OK, so I'm going to give a brief um, update to you just in terms of the changes to pharmacovigilance arising from the new vet regulation. Um, in terms of the basis for the changes, um, we just need to look at the recital for the new vet regulation. I'm not going to read this out, but just uh, want to highlight a few um, key phrases and terms that have been used in that text. So basically, it's to introduce measures to improve the operation of the pharmacovigilance, pharmacovigilance system, take account of changes and technological developments, and there's reference to a pharmacovigilance database at union level, which should be established to improve detection of suspected adverse events and to facilitate the pharmacovigilance surveillance. And there's also reference to good pharmacovigilance practice and also signal management being a gold standard. For those of you who, I, I presume most of you are very familiar with the text at this stage, but for those of you who are not, um, Section 5 of the new vet regulation deals specifically with pharmacovigilance and there are nine articles there. And before the webinar, we had invited everybody to submit any questions that they had on the various topics being covered. So thank you to those that have submitted questions on pharmacovigilance and what I plan to do in the next few slides is to try and try and address as many of those questions as possible. Um, the questions received um, unsurprisingly related to the um, responsibilities of the marketing authorization holder, the qualified person responsible for pharmacovigilance, the QPPV, and also signal management. So I'll try and address as many of those questions in the next few slides. But before doing so, just in terms of an update in terms of where we are and what stage we're at, as you know, um, back in February 2019, the Commission requested recommendations from the European Medicines Agency on good pharmacovigilance practice, the PSMF and its summary. And in May of 2020, the agency provided that recommendation to the Commission. This is a screenshot of the um, European Medicines Agency's website, so you can actually find the recommendations there. Another source of, in, of information is the Commission's website, and you can see under the implementing acts there, that's where they will be publishing um, the acts that are going out for public consultation, so it's worth your while keeping an eye on that website in particular. In terms of the um, implementing act for um, GPP and the PSMF, um, the Commission has established an expert working group under the auspices of the Standing Committee on BMPs. There have been three meetings to date, one last year and two already this year, and it's our understanding that there won't be any further meetings because the Act has um, progressed to a sufficient state where it's due to be um, published for public consultation shortly. 
the Commission will then commence an internal procedure process with a view to adoption by the Standing Committee. And it's our understanding that a simple, uh, single implementing regulation will be published for GPP and the PSMF. So then getting back to the questions that we received, so I'll start with the um, PSMF. So as you know, farming vigilance obligations will apply as of the 28th of January of next year. And it's our understanding that there will be no transition period. The main change is that the detailed description of the farming vigilance system is being replaced with a farming vigilance system master file. So I'll refer to that as a PSMF from now on. So as and from the 28th of January, a PSMF must be in place for all veterinary medicinal products. However, unlike the DDPS, the PSMF is not in, actually included in the dossier, but instead only a summary of the PSMF is. And it's our understanding that um, for existing products, um, there's no requirement to replace the DDPS with a summary of the PSMF. However, there are still ongoing discussions um, at the Commission and agency level, so that still has to be confirmed. We also understand that the PSMF is to be located in the Union, either at the site where the main farming vigilance activities of the MAH are performed, or alternatively at the site where the QPPB operates. But basically what's required from MAH is that they need to provide a physical address, and this has relevance in terms of farming vigilance inspections because they will take place at that site. The MAH can have one or more PSMFs, but only one PSMF for a given product. In terms of the content of the summary of the PSMF, it's expected to follow the recommendations from the agency. And as I've referred to in a previous slide, you can get those recommendations from the agency's website. But we expect it to include a signed statement by the MAH and QPPB, which is similar to what's required today for the DDPS. The name, contact details and place of operation of the QPPB and the PSMF reference number and its location. And because the summary of the PSMF is included in the dossier, then obviously any changes to the, P um, to the summary will require a variation. Now, um, the variation required will be one not requiring assessment. And as Mary has already indicated, the Commission have published the implementing regulation. So section C deals with safety and efficacy and the sections in particular for pharmacovigilance are section C1, C5 and C6. In terms of good pharmacovigilance practice, as I've already said, the discussions on that are ongoing at Commission level at the, the Standing Committee. Um, there's a requirement in the legislation for MAH to comply with GPP. So I know you're all interested in well, what's in the GPP. Well, the agency are currently working in cooperation with stakeholders. There's been a number of meetings in terms of developing guidelines and it's a series of modules on good veterinary pharmacovigilance practice. And once those um, guidelines have been finalised, they'll go out for a period of public consultation in due course. Unfortunately, we're not aware of exactly precisely when that is, but it's expected to happen shortly. In terms of the QPPV, there are a number of new responsibilities for the QPPV. I've just listed the main ones here. Um, they'll be responsible for elaborating and maintaining the PSMF. They'll also be responsible for recording all suspected adverse events in the Union Farm Vigilance database within 30 days of receipt. So this is a change because, as you're probably aware, there were cer certain types of adverse events that had to undergo expedited reporting. That's within 15 days. But now all adverse events need to be um, su submitted to the database within 30 days. So because of that, there'll be no longer a requirement for causality assignments. So the ABON classification has gone. And likewise, there'll be no need to differentiate between serious and non-serious events. So there's a move now to signal management, and it's anticipated that we'll use a medically important event list for signal prioritization. And finally, the QPPV will be responsible for applying the signal management process. In terms of the signal management process itself, um, periodic safety update reports are no longer required from the 28th of January. So we're now moving to signal management and the process will be elaborated further in the implementing regulation on GPP and in particular in the agency's guidelines that are currently being drafted. But we understand that the signal management process will follow a risk based approach and the MAH may choose to either use the Union Farm Vigilance database or their own database to perform signal management. But irrespective of which database they use, there's still a requirement that they need to record at least annually 
all results and outcomes of the signal management process in the Farming Commission's database. You've seen this slide um, from a previous presentation, but it's just to reiterate the close relationship between the union, <coughs> excuse me, product database and the Farming Commission's database. And also just to note that the public will have access to the Farming Commission's database on a limited access basis. In terms of the information to be included in the Farming Commission's database, um, the, the main points or the main aspects are suspected adverse events, so I've listed them there, I'm not going to read them out. Information on the QPPV, reference number of the PSMF, results of the Farm Commission's inspections, and also results and outcomes of the signal management process, including a conclusion on the benefit risk balance for each product. I say that's to be done annually. So that's a very brief update on the changes to the farm equipment um, aspects. So I'll um, thank you for your attention and hand you back to David. Thank you. Hey, um, thank you very much, Paul, for that presentation. Um, it is, uh, um, again, a, a, a um, comprehensive overview of the changes um, uh, coming about in the farm equipment area and again, uh, a, subject or topic uh, that is um, a very uh, where there is significant change and um, again if those in the audience if anyone has got any questions for Paul please uh, submit through the Q&A function and we'll look to address them um, in the Q&A session at the end of the presentations and um, the next presentation we're going to deal with then is on the topic of um, SBC um, and labeling um, here to present on this topic um, is uh, Rona McHugh um, Rona is a, an executive assessor within the uh, pharmaceutical assessment team um, and she is also um, the CMDB uh, representative. So um, Rona, in your own time, please. Thank you very much, Chair. So good morning, everybody, just about. Um, so I'm going to follow on now from Mary's, Elaine's and Paul's presentation and speak about some of the changes to the SPC and labelling. So that is the product information resulting from Regulation 2019. So as David already mentioned, I'm the Irish CMDB member and I am also chair of the legislation subgroup on SPC and labelling at CMDB. So I have a particular interest in this topic myself. Next slide, please. OK, so this presentation will look at three key questions which are being asked by our stakeholders right around now. And they are, what are the changes required to my SPC and labels? When do I have to implement them? And finally, how will my joint <laughs> UK labels be affected? Next slide, please. OK, so following adoption by both CVMP and CMDV at their respective March meetings, the QRD templates were released for an extended six week uh, public consultation period only yesterday. Um, so it's important for stakeholders to engage with this consultation process and we encourage you to send your comments within the time frame set, which I think is the 14th of May, in order to have your say in the future of the shaping of these templates. The ultimate aim then will be to publish the templates in quarter four 2021 and that will be about three months before the implementation date. Next slide please. Okay, so I think it's first, it, it's important to note that given there was a very short timeline for revision of templates, the focus really was strictly on aligning both the SPC and labelling templates with new regulation requirements. So bar the correction of some grammatical errors, there were very little editorial changes made. I'm not going to go through this screen in too much detail just due to time constraints, but just to note some of the changes to the SPC um, and they include new sections, for example, for special restrictions for use. Um, we have new standard phrases for limited markets and exceptional circumstances. And again, new standard phrases to classify VMPs into either prescription or non-prescription medicines. Next slide, please. OK, so in terms of labelling, we now have separate templates to be created for the outer and the immediate packs. So as you can see, the labelling has become an awful lot more simplified and the end user is now being directed towards the package leaflet to obtain the information. So you can see there's a new standalone heading for read the package leaflet before use. In terms then of the small immediate packaging, 
Um, there is an implementing act, so it's Article 17.3, and this will determine the size of the packaging units for which this template can be used. So this particular implementing act isn't foreseen for adoption until the end of 2024. It's part of the third implementing act package. Nonetheless, CMDV will start work on this towards the end of the year. Next slide, please. OK, so the immediate labelling requirements have been significantly reduced um, with all the headings you can see on your screen now. They have now been removed. So things like special warnings are removed and um, also removed is the method of administration, which would include a standard statement like your shake well before use. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the package leaflet, then some of the changes. So the local representative is now to be listed primarily for the reporting of suspected adverse events. In terms of the blue box, um, in Directive 2001-82, it, it had Article 58.5, which accommodated the blue box requirements. Um, there seems to be a similar provision within Regulation 2019, and it's been identified under Article 14.2. And this should allow certain information on distribution and possession to appear at the package leaflet, but segregated right at the bottom from the, the rest of the information. And in terms of the provision of a package leaflet, so member states now can decide whether the package leaflet is to be available in paper or electronically or indeed both. So the HPRA understand from our discussions with DAFM that a paper version will be required for the next few years, but that provision of an electronic version is also being considered as it will have its advantages. And it may be an option for the future if a company wish to provide it or maybe if they want to provide it in addition to the paper format. Next slide, please. OK, so Article 17.2 is covered under an implementing act and it allows for abbreviations and pictograms on the immediate and the outer packaging. So again, like the other implementing act, the adoption of this one isn't foreseen until the end of 2024. But again, CMTV are going to start work on this later in the year. But in the meantime, the already agreed QRD pictograms, you might recognise those animals on their screen there, that they can continue to be used on the packaging. Next slide, please. So Article 13, this is one of the May provisions of the regulation, and it can allow marketing authorisation holders to include additional information and that's deemed useful, but not promotional on the labelling. Um, and this provision is facilitated at a national level and it's going to be addressed by way of EU guidance. CMDV have committed to look at this in around June of this year. So just to say that something that the HBRA are really committed to is to encourage the use of multilingual labelling um, and this will ma maximise product availability. Again, this comes under the scope of the new regulation. And we really do hope that strong consideration is given to this during the development of any EU guidance on Article 13. Next slide, please. So another big question then today is when exactly do we have to implement these changes to our uh, templates? Next slide, please. So in terms of new veterinary medicinal products, it's quite clear that those authorised from the 29th of January 2022, then the labelling of the VMP, it must contain only the information specified in the Articles 10 to 14. It's a little bit different then for the existing MAs and it's envisaged in line with Article 152.2 that applicants will have five years to implement the QRD template changes. Now, the mechanism of how the changes will be introduced it is currently under discussion at the level of CMDV. One option being thrown into the ring is potentially a variation requiring assessment. This would mean that for marketing authorization holders that they may select to submit a variation at the time of their choosing. So they could tie it in with that timeline that best suits their say business model, their marketing strategy, supply chain, etc. Next slide, please. So one question that popped up quite frequently within the invited questions ahead of this webinar was, how will Regulation 2019 impact my joint labels with the UK? Next slide, please. 
So as you well know, the history of the HPRA and the VMD working relationship when it comes to joint labelling, it stems right back to the year 2000 when we started our unofficial due labelling process. The HBRA are committed to continue to support joint labelling with the UK and that is subject to the UK and the EU operating and equivalent regulatory framework and once our opinions align. And those products that were joint labelled before the 28th of January 2022, well, they will remain joint labelled. That is once the product information is identical in both the UK and in Ireland. Next slide, please. And um, so that's all for me and thanks for listening. If you do have any questions, please feel free to add them to the Q&A and we'll try to cover them at the end. Um, and I now pass you back to David to introduce the next presenter. Thank you. Hey, and thank you very much, Rona, again, for a very clear and concise presentation. Um, we will move on directly to the, um, the sixth presentation, I think it is, um, and that is uh, relates to manufacturing and uh, uh, generally and GDP of active substances. Um, and here to give uh, this presentation is uh, uh, Paul Sexton. Uh, Paul um, is a GMP policy manager um, in the compliance department of the HBRA. So, um, Paul, I will hand the floor to you. Thanks, David. And just to check, you can see my screen there. I can see the presentation and we okay. take your screen here. OK, so as uh, David had said, I'm going to address some GMP and GDP topics um, that are within the new veterinary regulation. Specifically, what I'm going to outline are uh, some of the areas where there are some significant changes, um, requirements for registration of manufacturers, importers and distributors of active substances, um, some uh, points on GMP guidance for active substances, uh, GDP guidance for active substances, and some points on GMP for veterinary medicinal products. And lastly, I'll just be touching on wholesaling of veterinary medicines. This is currently obviously regulated by DAFM and will continue to be regulated uh, by the department. So first, uh, registration of Irish manufacturers, importers and distributors of active substances with the HBRA will be required. And this information will be uploaded to an EU database. Um, many of you may be familiar with UDRA GMDP. Uh, it has a lot of this functionality already uh, in relation to the management of manufacturers, importers and distributors of active substances for human use. Um, and the Commission is looking at what modifications will be required to bring, you know, to, to uh, amend this to suit the veterinary regulation. So we anticipate that there'll be a similar registration process to that already in place for active substances for human use. There will be a requirement to have an annual update to the registration details, or if there is a potential impact on quality and safety, then an immediate update to the registration will be required. And there will be an obligation to only source from registered manufacturers, importers and distributors when uh, these activities are taking place within the EEA. Manufacturers of veterinary medicines may in themselves be importers in that they may be importing active substances for use in their own manufacturing processes and those uh, manufacturers of veterinary medicines will be required to register as importers with the HPRA. And importation activities would could also include the purchase from uh, an entity in a third country in addition to the receipt of uh, active substance from a third country uh, site. Distribution activities um, will include the procurement or purchase of active substances within the EEA, the holding or storage of active substances, supplying or selling of active substances within the EEA and export, that means the sale or physical supply of active substances outside the EEA. With regard to GMP guidance for active substances, we already have part two of the EU GMP guide, which includes manufacture of active substances for veterinary uh, use in veterinary medicines within its scope. 
There will be, however, a future implementing act on GMP for active substances that will come into force in 2025. The HPRA will conduct uh, inspections of manufacturers of that implementing act when it, it comes into force. In the meantime, uh, we continue to use part two of the EU GMP guide and uh, some you know, manufacturers of veterinary active substances uh, have voluntarily um, asked for inspections uh, at this point in relation to um, the activities conducted at their sites. So the plan will be to conduct initial and ongoing inspections of manufacturers uh, of active substances in accordance with the HPRA risk-based inspection program. With regard to GDP guidance for active substances, there will be an implementing act on GDP for active substances used as starting materials in veterinary medicinal products, and that will come into force in January 2022. It has similar uh, principles to the existing GDP guidelines for active substances for medicinal products for human use. And uh, the HPRA will conduct inspections of importers and distributors against the implementing act um, on GDP for active substances. The plan again would be to conduct initial and ongoing inspections in accordance with the risk based inspection program and factors in terms of prioritization of sites for inspection will also take into account whether or not a site has uh, an existing registration for the importation or distribution of um, active substances for human use that could be taken into account in prioritizing the inspections. For um, just for further reading there, uh, I've just included a link to uh, advice on implementing measures which was provided by, this is in relation to the GDP guidance for active substances. This was provided by the inspectors working group to the commission and work on the development of the implementing act is still ongoing. With regard to GMP for med veterinary medicinal products, I think a key point here will be to map the supply chain for active substances. Many sites are already keenly aware of their manufacturers of the active substance, but may not be have a, a map of all of the distribution or distri distri distributors through which the active substances uh, will be handled. So um, manufacturers of veterinary medicines must use active substances which have been manufactured in accordance with GMP. That is an existing requirement. And in future, there will be a requirement to ensure that uh, they, it is distributed in accordance with GDP. Uh, manufacturers of veterinary medicines will also be obliged to perform risk based audits of manufacturers, importers and distributors in the supply chain for active substances. We currently have the same general GMP guidance for human and veterinary medicine as being part one of the GMP guide. Uh, I'm just highlighting here that you know the development of this guidance continues whilst awaiting um, the uh, introduction of the implementing act and of particular relevance to veterinary manufacturers will be a, a proposed a update to Annex 4 on manufacture of veterinary medicinal products other than uh, immunological veterinary medicinal products and Annex 5, manufacture of immunological veterinary medicinal products. These uh, revisions to these annexes will be taking place as a joint initiative between the EMA and PICS. And there are also some new GMP guidances planned, uh, autogenous vaccines. Uh, there will be a, a, a guidance document um, prepared and it will be based on an existing CMDV paper dating from 2017. I've put in uh, the link there as to where it can be located. And also of interest is that there is a, a meeting taking place um, later this year in relation to the manufacture of autogenous vaccines. And I've just included uh, some information on that there as well. There'll also be a new guidance on novel therapies for veterinary use. Um, the regulation uh, requires implementation of new GMP guidelines in 2025 and it's for legal reasons. We saw a similar approach to, uh, taking place in relation to uh, investigation of medicinal products for human use. Um, it's not envisaged that there's going to be, uh, you know, a complete uh, digression between the GMP requirements for human and veterinary medicines that 
th these documents will be continued, uh, or the, the guidance will continue to remain aligned um, because many of the manufacturers could be operating uh, um, <coughs> in, in both fields. Lastly, I'm just mentioning here about the wholesale of veterinary medicinal products that is regulated by DAFM um, and will continue to be regulated by DAFM. Uh, inspection will be carried out by the inspectors of the department and authorizations will be granted by the department. And uh, the wholesale distribution authorization and any GDP certificates associated with the arising from the inspections will be uploaded to the EU database and publicly accessible. There is an implementing act on GDP for veterinary medicinal products. Uh, it's currently in development and will come into force in January 2022 and largely based on the existing GDP guidelines for human medicines. So thank you very much for your attention and I'll hand back to David. Okay, um, thank you very much, Paul, for again, a very clear um, and concise uh, presentation. Um, so we are now going to move to the, the last presentation in the series. Um, and uh, I'm here, I'm going to hand back to, uh, uh, to Gabriel, who will give a, a brief um, intro uh, um, into uh, the complementary national legislation. So um, Gabriel, please. Thank you, David. Um, can I just confirm that you can see my presentation OK? Um, yes, and we can see you uh, well too and hear you. Thank you. OK, and um, uh, thank you to the over 200 uh, attendees who are still on the line. Um, so um, we, this is the last presentation, as David has mentioned, and it's quite a short one. Um, And basically what I want to just to to discuss briefly is to outline um, the fact that the current uh, statutory instrument SI 786 of 2007 is going to uh, be repealed. Um, and, it, you know, in the context of this regulation, the re regulation is directly applicable, so it doesn't require that the national legislation itself be changed, but it does provide for certain opportunities uh, as may provisions which can be taken forward in a member state and then certain existing provisions in 786 are effectively not compatible with the regulation so um so will will need to be changed anyway uh, in this presentation i want to focus however on changes where the hpra is the competent authority and just to say as well that we have been engaged with DAFM um, for an, a number of years now in relation to the challenge of implementing the legislation. Um, so as you probably are aware, DAFM began a public consultation uh, on in, in June last year. Um, we are also uh, been in discussion with DAFM on particular provisions um, and uh, you can see them there. Uh, um, and then also in respect of the elaboration of delegated and implementing acts. Um, so we're providing, um, if you like, subject matter experts uh, and um, dealing with the provision of the advice uh, at, at various levels, um, depending on whether it falls within our competence or, uh, or, or not. So some acts, for example, internet supply and so on will be responsibility of DAFM directly. And also, of course, in respect of the development of the Union Product Database, um, because uh, JAFM is developing a, a, a its own national e-prescribing system and clearly uh, developments on the UPD will be um, very important to the development of that uh, system. And just to acknowledge that those discussions are ongoing, uh, we don't have a precise timeline uh, as to when the new SI will be available. But we understand that with the volume of um, work that's ongoing in the department that it, po it probably won't be available to us until towards the end of the year. Um, so then what activities do we expect to remain largely as is? Well, the system for classification of borderline products 
um, we, and we have a guideline on our website, guideline to the definition of an animal remedy. That process is, um, we've agreed in principle that it will continue. There may be site modifications to it and so on, but the overall classification process, the HPRA will um, remain the competent authority for classifying such products and the process will operate pretty much as heretofore. Um, similarly, with the uh, arrangement for licensing clinical trials on veterinary medicines, um, yes, there will be tweaks to the process and so on, but the overall responsibility will remain with the HPRA uh, and we will develop up um, new guidance as we progress through the uh, when the new legislation is available. Homeopathic registrations will remain. Um, they are being published to the UPD, um, so that's, but the, the overall assessment process remains as is. And insofar as the HPRA role in the collection of sales data um, in for SFAC, that as we understand it will continue as well. And that's to be complemented, as you know, by a separate system for collection of sales data to the UPD um, and, and by collection of use data which is foreseen uh, by the, to be conducted by the Department of Agriculture in due course. Um, some activities where there may be change or there may be new uh, activities. So Elaine Hines has mentioned that there will be a process for registration of certain veterinary medicines for exotic pets under Article 5.6. So these are for um, you know a list of 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 species which are named cage birds, pigeons, um, terrarium animals, aquatic species, and so on, uh, aquarium fish. Sorry, um, where um, the product isn't subject to prescription currently, and where there's no um, no need for prescription, uh, and those. On, unlike the system today where we have where those products are exempted from all requirements in the future there will be a requirement that they meet certain provisions of the legislation including that they're uploaded to the UPD including that they're manufactured in accordance to the GMP requirements and including that they're subject to pharmacovigilance requirements so in order to 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 do that process we will have to have a registration system in place and we hope to have a sec a, a separate webinar to deal with that um, probably during uh, the latter half of April. So watch the website for information on that. Um, you're aware that there will be no PSURs, so um, that process will cease uh, in, in January 2022. There'll be no renewal applications. Um, you've mentioned that there, there will be the system for variations not requiring assessment. And there will be significant change to the system for authorization of parallel imports. Um, I'm not going to go into it because there we have very few parallel import licenses in existence, maybe two or three, something like that. Um, but the uh, the current system will be substantially changed, uh, and I'm inviting you to keep uh, in touch with our website to get more detail on that as we make it available. And uh, with that, Chairman, I think it's now time for the question and answer time. So uh, I'll hand back to you to compare that, please. Thank you. OK, and um, thank you very much, um, Gabriel, um, for that presentation. So uh, that's come to the end of our series of presentations. I'm very conscious that it was a sort of very wide range in session and that there's an awful lot of information um, has been provided. Um, but what I would, uh, we will now proceed to try and address a number of the questions that have been um, submitted uh, by yourself. We will do that verbally. Um, but as I said, any that we don't get to address uh, during this session, um, we will be providing uh, a complete list of questions uh, with written responses to those uh, following the, uh, this meeting. Um, also in response to a general question that was received, um, would a recording of this webinar be made available on the uh, HBRA website? Um, the intention is that a recording would be made available. So um, for anything that you've missed, um, uh, then it would be possible for you to, to, to catch up. Um, so with that, um, I would suggest that we look to take um, some of the questions uh, that have come in. And um, maybe the first person that I would go back to um, uh, would be Elaine. Um, there were a number of questions received um, in relation to the UPD. Um, and uh, there was one in particular in relation to 
um, the um, organizations um, registered in OMS. So can I ask you to take that one, please? And maybe while, while you're at it, if you also deal with the question relating to uh, prepare, preparedness, um, National Council Authority Preparedness for Uploading Legacy Data, please. OK, thank you, David. So relating to the question um, on OMS, um, yes, as we understand it, all manufacturing organisation data should be registered and uh, including organisations in non-EU countries. MAHs are, yes, also needed to be registered in OMS. Um, we do know for the, the initial submission of veterinary authorised products into UPD, the requirement is limited to the provision of information on the MAH and the manufacturers uh, for batch release sites, and that's defined in Chapter 4 of the uh, EU Implementation Guide. But we do expect uh, for new product submissions from 2022 that this scope will be broadened, so that's why we say all organisation data. So I hope that addresses that question. Uh, in relation to the the IT question and, and our uh, preparations for our submissions. So there was a new approach agreed for the submission of legacy data in January 2021 um, given to us from the EMA. We are currently working to adapt our internal systems to capture the mandatory data for legacy data upload and also the new product data that's required for, up, uh, for inputting into the system post January 2022. We're also working on all the mandatory spore referential lists, um, mapping all of our organisations and working on our substance list also. So as you mentioned in the question, we are working to extremely tight timelines and we have a huge catalogue of work to, to do. Um, so following updates to our system that we're doing, we also need to further uh, uh, enrich the data that's in the systems. So to update our system is complex, um, as any updates have to take into account human medicines also, um, because we are a joint agency and we share one common system. Just a quick update on the legacy upload. So refer the reference member states will submit their product data starting in June 21. The deadline for these submissions is the end of October. Uh, in order to submit this data, we have to be compliant with the implementation guide. From November to mid-January, uh, we the CMS, so where we are CMS for a product, we have to submit in the national data sets for those products. And we also have to submit in our nationally authorised product data, which can happen between June um, and January, I think. Uh, the HPRA hopes to provide this submission via, to the UPD via the API. However, we do know the UPD allows this to happen via the user interface and, and ad hoc temporary files. So relating to the fire message question, our IT department are currently working with the EMA to understand the data structures and resources um, that are required for fire and we're working to connect to the API and we have been having weekly meetings with the EMA since January. Um, unfortunately, we don't have an IT colleague available on this, uh, this webinar to give further a further update on that, but we can provide further specific uh, information in the published responses after after this webinar. Is that okay, David? Okay, it's a very comprehensive response. Thank you very much. Um, maybe if we go to Mary next. Um, Mary, there was a question in relation to um, implications for a variation not requiring assessment if rejected. Do you want to take that question? Sure, yeah, I can take that. Thanks, David. Um, so basically, I suppose if the variation is rejected in UPD, the implications will probably depend on the reason for the rejection. So it could be rejected because um, some of the documents were not provided or it was considered that the conditions had not been met. Um, if that was the case, it could either be resubmitted um, with the required documents or with the confirmation of the conditions, or it could actually be submitted as a variation requiring assessment under the Z category, the appropriate Z category from the classification guideline. So I hope when the classification guideline is published for variations requiring assessment, it will be clear that um, any of the variations not requiring assessment that actually don't meet the requirements or meet the conditions required for submission via UPD can also be submitted as variations requiring assessment using the Z categories within that guideline. So it will essentially depend on the reason for the rejection of the um, application in UPD. So 
So I hope that addresses it. OK, and um, thank you very much again for a very clear and comprehensive answer. Um, I would next propose to move on to Paul. Paul, a, a series of questions that come in in relation to pharmacovigilance topics. Um, maybe if you pick up the ones relating to the um, pharmacovigilance system master file and, and um, see, can you uh, pick off a number of those questions, please? Thank you, David. Um, yeah, so one of the questions we received just in terms of the content of the summary of the PSMF. So um, as outlined in the presentation, it's our understanding that that will um, reflect what's in the um, recommendation from the agency. So what we're talking about is the signed statement by the marketing authorization holder and the QPPV um, that they have the necessary means to fulfill their tasks and responsibilities. Also the name, contact details and place of operation of the QPPV and the PSMF reference number and location. So say so that's in the summary of the PSMF that needs to be included in the dossier. In terms of the, um, we've had a question on the PSMF about um, is prior approval required? Um, from the 28th of January, um, as I said in the presentation, MAHs are expected to have the Farm Vision System master file um, and it must be in place for all VMPs. The only um, approval will be for the summary of the PSMF that goes into applications as in from the 28th of January. So um, it's our understanding that there won't be any approval of the um, PSMFs themselves, but they have to be in place for pharmacovigilance vigilance inspections. Um, in terms of another question that we had was just in terms of um, the QPPV related information. Was it to be held on the Union Product Database or the Farm Covisions Database? And just to clarify that um, according to the regulation, um, that information needs to be held on the Farm Covisions Database. But I just want to highlight that because the Implementing Act is still under discussion, um, there is still some discussion about what information is on which of the two databases. Um, the point being though that there won't be duplication, so the information will be on either one database or the other, but the plan is that the two databases will interact closely. Um, so I think that's all the questions I had on the PSMF. Thank you, David. OK. OK, thank you very much for that, Paul. And um, again, we do acknowledge that there are a number of other questions in the farm provisions area and we will look to address those um, in writing. So thank you again for very clear uh, responses to those points. Um, Rona, maybe if I go to you next, um, there was um, a, a question in relation to joint labelling or one or two questions around that. Do you want to address that particular point, please? Yeah, thanks very much, David. So there was a question there um, asking whether joint labelling will still be available for newly authorised products post January 2022. So again, definitely, you know, if it's something that we are able to continue, we are definitely going to encourage applicants to do so. Um, the UK or the VMD will remain the competent authority for UK Northern Ireland, who will be part of the DCP and MRP procedures. Um, you know, a lot of our products are joint labelled with the UK currently, possibly 50 to 60 percent of them. You know, we're a small market. So again, anything that we can do to promote joint labelling, we will do. Um, again, it is really, as I said, mentioned in the slide, it will be based on us operating an equivalent regulatory framework and once our opinions align. And I would imagine that it possibly will involve a little bit more work on behalf of marketing authorization holders where we might have to, you know, as anyone who was involved years ago in our dual labeling process, that it might be a little bit like that aspect of it. But again, we will do everything we can to make sure that it, it does work for as long as it possibly can once the regulatory framework is aligned. OK, thank you very much for that, Rona. Rona, there was also a question came in in respect to renewals and a number of questions came in at, before the webinar. Uh, would you like to pick up on that point and um, what happened to renewals post January? Yeah, thanks, Dave. That's a very good question on the renewals, and I know Gabriel touched on it just in his final presentation there. So um, marketing authorization is authorized post January 2022. They, they will not be subject to renew, renew a procedure um, given that it's not included within the text of the regulation. In terms of existing marketing authorizations, 
um, individual decisions uh, granting the marketing authorization concerned, they will have to be amended because, as you know, at the moment we issue them with a five year limit. Um, so they will have to be amended to make the, their duration unlimited. And this is in order to comply with the regulation. So the manner in which member states decide to amend these decisions will be at their own discretion. Um, just to let you know that the topic is under discussion at CMDV and it's due to be discussed again in the April meeting. Um, but we do hope that a harmonised approach will be considered. Um, the HPRA does need a mechanism to affect the change um, and we will be looking at a solution that you know has the least amount of administrative burden for both ourselves and for marketing authorization holders. But again, once a decision is taken, we will communicate this through the appropriate channels so um, the message today, watch this space for, for that information, please. Okay, thank you very much, Rona, again, for a very clear answer. I'm quite conscious of the time um, and we will look to, to conclude on time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give the last question um, to um, Paul, this is Paul Sexton this time. And if, um, a question came in around novel therapies, Paul, if you want to take that one, please. Thanks, David. Um, so yeah, it, in terms of development of, you know, GMP guidance for novel therapies, this is at a very early stage, but there is information on what constitutes novel therapies on the EMA's uh, website. And, uh, you know, from, at a high level, I suppose they are quite similar to what would be an advanced therapy product for, for human use, um, such as, you know, products uh, including uh, stem cell based products um, so you know the the approach that the HPRA would take in regulation of these in terms of their manufacture would be what uh, following the EU guidance uh, which has yet to be developed uh, in relation to the manufacture of these products okay thank you Back to you, David. OK, no, thank you for that was my uh, I was having IT issues uh, again. Thank you very uh, much for a very clear um, answer to that question. And um, we will conclude the Q&A session there. Um, I know that a lot more questions have come in um, to us. And as I say, we will look to address those in writing. Um, the questions and answers will uh, be published on the HBRA website. We would hope to do that within the next fortnight. Um, in addition, as I say, uh, there will be a recording of the webinar uh, made available. And again, we will look to do that in the coming weeks. Um, so um, I am then tasked with um, some closing remarks, basically closing um, the event for this morning. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, as I, um, you know, you've already heard, we're sort of at peak, as it were, in terms of um, the implementation phase for the new veterinary regulation. There is an, an awful lot going on um, just at the moment. Um, you know, we have got secondary legislation that's um, currently being elaborated. It will not be finalized um, um, until, um, you know, later on this year. Um, there is a huge amount of activity in relation to um, generating uh, guidance documents to complement the new veterinary regulation. Um, that's been generated. Documents have been released for consultation uh, essentially on a monthly basis. Um, in addition to that, you've heard from um, um, Elaine and Paul uh, about um, the databases that are under development in order uh, to support the new functionality um, post January 2022. Um, so there's a huge amount going on in terms of the implementation uh, piece. Um, in addition to that, as indicated by Gabriel in his final presentation, um, we also have the, the complementary national legislation, which um, is currently being drafted and we would expect um, to see at some point uh, in Q3, beginning of Q4 this year. Um, so a lot, a lot of activity, as I say. If we could go on to the next slide, please. Um, but I guess at a very high level, the messages for um, the, the industry, marketing authorization holder representatives that are with us um, today, um, is that there is an obligation to be aware and know your responsibilities um, under the regulation. And I would hope that um, this morning you found informative and will um, 
uh, at least uh, provide some clarity around around those. Um, given that nothing or very little is nailed down at the moment, or there's a lot um, still under discussion, um, we would ask you to please stay informed. Um, in addition, noting that there are a lot of uh, guidance documents under, under development, um, and also, um, you know, there are legal texts to be agreed. Um, a number of those documents, many of them, will be subject to public consultation. So please do review those documents, those documents that are of interest to you, and have your say during the consultation process. Um, and the final sort of message, as it were, a headline message, is start to review internal procedures and be prepared to update um, in order that um, you as a market authorization holder can be compliant with your obligations post January 2022. Um, next slide, please. Um, in terms of um, staying informed, we just, yeah, um, there are, num are a number of information sources to highlight. Uh, one is the HPRA website, um, another is the European Medicines Agency website where um, you would provide, a, a, it would get a lot of information on documents that have been uh, developed by uh, the European Medicines Agency, uh, documents coming out of CBMP, CMBB. Um, you will also get progress updates in terms of the, uh, the development of the elaboration of the different databases. So a very important information source. Uh, another important information source um, is the European Commission website. And again, this is around um, the legal uh, text themselves. So the secondary legislation, the implementing and delegated acts that have been referenced in the previous presentations. Uh, another information source that's not um, uh, mentioned there is the Department of Agriculture um, website. Um, so that's um, also an information source um, to uh, keep an eye on in relation to, um, um, to the, the elaboration of the national legislation. Um, next slide, please. So the last thing for me to do today is um, thank you all um, very much for uh, joining us this morning uh, for this information session. Um, I do very much appreciate that it's very dense in terms of, uh, you know, the uh, material presented. Um, there was a, a lot uh, presented in a very short space of time. Um, but uh, as I say, uh, the information will be made available to you via the HBR website and you will have an opportunity um, to dip back into it if, uh, that's, uh, uh, if, if that is something that you wish to do. Um, so I hope you all found the um, event informative. I hope that it um, served to clarify at least some issues that you have. Um, and importantly, um, I hope that it identified uh, certain uh, information sources for you uh, that you will be able to get um, additional information between now and January 2022. Um, at some point um, towards the end of this year, in uh, quarter three or beginning of quarter four, um, the HPRA would plan to have uh, an information day, um, basically a further update. Um, a date has not been set yet. Um, we would hope, but there are no guarantees, but we would hope that we would be in a position to um, have that as an in-person event. Um, but um, one way or another, um, there will be um, a follow-on event uh, later on in the year. So just uh, to make you aware of that. So on that note, I would like to uh, close this meeting. Again, thank you all very much for participating uh, this morning. I would like also to thank both the presenters um, and those behind the scenes, uh, Gemma, um, uh, Megan and Rachel um, for uh, helping to organize the event. So. For now, I wish you all a good day and I wish you well in the implementation of Regulation 2019-6. Bye for now. Have a good day.